will now I'd like to turn the meeting over to Mr. Jerry Liu. Sir, you may begin. Great. Thank you very much, and thanks, everyone, for joining us. This is the third Thursday webcast series. It's a monthly webcast held at the lunch hour. The trainings leverage local successes by amplifying to a larger audience to model organizations, methods, materials, and approaches. Sessions are planned to last no more than an hour, with two presenters speaking on the same topic from slightly different perspectives, each for 10 to 15 minutes, followed by 10 to 15 minutes of questions and answers. Today's session is approved by the ISA for one CEU hour and by SAF for one CFE Category 2. If you haven't already given me your certification number, you can email me after this session. Also, most state landscape architecture boards require only a certificate of completion, which ACT is happy to provide to members who request that. This is a program of the Alliance for Community Trees, and I encourage you to consider joining if you're not a member. I also want to thank today's sponsors, the Home Depot Foundation and the USDA Forest Service. Today's session is Heading Towards Sustainability, Part 2, Community Orchards. Think globally, eat locally. A ready supply of fruit is more than just healthy. Community orchards may be part of the solution for helping to reduce our footprint in several ways. For starters, having locally grown food nearby supports the immediate economy, saves the drive to the store, and less fossil fuel is burned. Combine community gardens with homeowners in low-income neighborhoods, and you have a community building, social network building, crime fighting unit on your hands. There's a need for local tree organizations not only to operate community orchards and seed such programs, but also to help residents find high-quality trees and revitalize blighted municipal lands. Some communities are even setting up programs whereby AmeriCorps staff maintains and gleans homeowners' orchards just for the use of their land. Whether in a backyard or a parking strip, maybe you too should be envisioning community orchards. Our first presenter today is Ashley Atkinson. Ashley is the Director of Project Development and Director of Urban Agriculture for the Greening of Detroit. She has worked in the field of community gardening, urban greening, and vacant land reuse for over 10 years, first in Flint, where she co-founded the, uh, the Flint Urban Gardening and Land Use Corporation, then as the director of the Detroit Agriculture Network, and currently with the Greening Detroit, where she works with community groups to plan tree plantings, community gardens, and other green space in Detroit. Ashley is a graduate of both Michigan State University and the University of Michigan, where she studied international development, community organization, and environmental land use planning. And we are thrilled to have Ashley with us again. Thanks, Ashley. Thank you. Um, shall I start, Jared? You're ready to go. Excellent. Um, okay, so um, uh, just a little bit of background about the Greening of Detroit. We're celebrating our 20th anniversary this year. Our organization um, uh, began as a, a forestry and um, forest-based organization with a mission to reforest the city after we lost tens of thousands of trees to the Dutch elm disease. Um, and um, since we, we incorporated in um, uh, 1989, we have planted over 60,000 trees. Um, and uh, the focus was really um, in public places along streets and sidewalks and in public parks, um, uh, really ornamental and shade trees, not so much fruit. Um, and then in 2003, our organization began working with other um, partner organizations to do a lot more in the vein of urban agriculture. Um, and today, uh, our urban agriculture programs support um, uh, 517 family gardens, 244 community gardens, and about 50 school gardens across the city. Um, so the first slide here really kind of shows you our magic formula for success with our urban agriculture programs. Um, a lot of people join the program to receive the resources that they need in order to have a successful garden. Um, and we pair those resources with educational opportunities, you know, hands-on in the field, um, really accessible. Um, and then um, we try to, to support the, the, um, the growth and the, um, you know, the, um, the sustainability of those gardens that we're starting to initiate all over the city um, with, with um, uh, opportunities to connect people both at the citywide and at the um, community-based um, community or neighborhood-based level um, throughout the city. Um, and I'm really sharing um, that with you because I think it really relates um, very strongly to um, our orcharding and perennial fruit programs. 
Um, uh, so one of the one of the resources that are distributed to all of those gardens across the city um, are perennial fruit um, plants and particularly um, fruit trees. Um, in a city like Detroit, um, uh, th there's a couple of things that um, need to be taken into consideration. Uh, one is, um, in order to have a very high survivability rate, which we pride ourselves on, um, the, the stock that goes out into public places needs to be fairly large. And I don't know about you guys, but in Detroit, it's pretty hard to find um, a, a wide variety of, um, of fruit tree stock that is, you know, one or larger um, inch caliper tree. So um, we have taken our abundance of vacant lands and created a number of fruit tree nurseries across the city. Um, and, and these are just simply um, vacant spaces that we um, we amend the soil slightly. Um, uh, by no means are we um, making uh, a, a very, very fertile places for these trees, but we do amend the soil, the soil slightly. Um, we buy fruit tree stock that, um, you know, is, is very small, usually whips. Um, bare root in the spring, and then we nursery the plants for three years. Um, and uh, every year we take out a third of the crop um, after the, its third year, um, and we transplant it um, into community spaces, um, particularly community gardens, school gardens, and family gardens across the city. So on the first slide you saw the whips going in the ground, and, and in this slide you're seeing three years later um, that fruit tree being planted at a school. Um, and so this really allows us to have at the ready a lot of perennial fruit stock um, for those community and school gardens across the city. Um, and we're able to plant, um, you know, pears and, and, and um, uh, multiple sets of fruit trees in, in all kinds of community gardens um, uh, throughout Detroit. So that's the resource part. And, you know, the, um, the next step is really the education part. We feel it's really important not to just give these, you know, great resources um, uh, out throughout the community, but to pair those resources so that people with education, accessible education, so that people are really getting the most out of them. So um, every year we teach in a number of fruit-based um, classes. Um, we teach um, organic fruit management. We teach pruning, um, both um, to get as much fruit from the trees as possible, as well as to make sure that they stay healthy. Um, and we also teach um, pl planning for fruit, um, fruit selection, and um, planting. Um, you know, so again, our classes are all hands-on. If, if the topic of the class is um, training, we're tra outdoor training trees. If it's pruning, we're outdoor pruning. Um, uh, and then, you know, the third pillar of our program is connection. You know, we, we, we have the, the, the stock available. We pair that with education. And then we really create opportunities for people to connect with the plants as well as with one another. So this is an example of um, a volunteer group coming out to um, harvest cherries, um, you know, getting people in touch with each other and in touch with the crops. And then we get the crops um, uh, uh, to the plate um, or to the, the consumer. And so one, you know, one of the ways that we do that um, and it's really, really good for our programs is by making sure that our perennial fruit harvested from trees is available um, with our other fruits and vegetables at farmers markets um, and to restaurants that we sell to all over the city. Um, and finally, um, we find um, really interactive ways to um, process that fruit um, either by making cider or cooking in a kitchen, making pies or other delicious um, foods, like um, this Tuesday we made some fruit-based chutney um, that was delicious. And we're, um, as a result, really connecting people to one another through food, um, which is uh, a really important part of our program. Um, in addition to making sure that we're providing perennial fruit, um, uh, particularly fruit trees um, to hundreds of gardens across the city. We're also really working to establish um, larger uh, groves of fruit trees or, or community orchards. And so our process um, with that is really to um, uh, choose locations where there's a lot of, um, a lot of interest in um, caring for orchards over the long haul, because as we all know, um, uh, there are um, many, many years of, of um, you know, love and labor goes into um, getting fruit from fruit trees. So we, we have a community-based approach that engages communities in, um, in choosing a location and planning out that location 
um, in choosing the stock that will be available, the design of the orchard, um, and then in, um, in planting everything. Um, this particular orchard is 118 fruit trees um, in a city park called Romanowski Farm Park. And um, right across the sidewalk, we have an acre um, in, in vegetables as well. So it's about two acres with an acre being in fruit and an acre being in vegetables. Um, and over the years, you know, we, we um, started with a smaller stock. And in this particular location over the years, the, um, the orchard has been a great place um, for um, the community as, all, as well as for that outdoor kind of training and classroom experience that we're trying to create citywide. Um, and you can see the trees in the background, they're, they're um, really um, getting quite big and, and actually producing fruit this year. Um, it, it really is a great way to um, blend that, that perennial fruit and annual um, fruits and vegetables that we're trying to foster throughout the city. Thanks. All right, thanks, Ashley. Uh, if the operator can open the lines for questions, please. Thank you. At this time, if you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your touchstone keypad. Press star 1 to ask a question. Please record your name at the prompt so I may introduce your question. One Wait. moment, please. If, uh, if you're feeling shy or if it's just easier for you to type to, you're welcome to type your question into the question and answer manager up along the top uh, tab, and I can come on the line and read your question for you. Um, one of the things I, I wanted to ask, and, and I think you pretty much answered this, but one of the trends that we're seeing in, in among urban forestry groups is really a focus on education first. Um, and so not just doing a program because the community is asking for it or not just doing it because you uh, applied for a grant and got it, but really making sure that um, people are getting educated along at the same time. So they're, uh, you know, they're, they're taking the classes on how to care for the trees. They're they're learning more about um, the educational aspect, which goes along with the program. Would you say that was a similar focus for you, or, or not really? Um, yeah, I, I definitely would say so. Um, you know, when you really look at all the resources that we're providing, um, the, the perennial fruit crop is, is one of the more expensive items. Um, and so um, it's really important that we um, we have community members invested either, you know, in one or two fruit trees in their community garden or in starting um, a, a new orchard. And so in addition to um, really making sure that the educational offerings are available um, with the orchard, um, uh, because they are more expensive and, and, and really more maintenance um, over the long haul, one of the things that we do is um, we create like an application for, for an orchard and um, along with the application there are certain eligibility requirements and so um, it, it allows, um, it, it really helps to vet um, the different issues that might come up um, through the process. For example, um, who owns the land? Um, if they don't own the land, do they have permission to use the land for 15 years or more? Um, uh, who the primary contact is? Um, what kind of success have they demonstrated with other projects that would um, demonstrate that they're ready to, you know, take on the the um, the huge, um, you know, the huge project of of having and maintaining an orchard, um, and then um, and then we require that they attend a certain number of training um, opportunities, the training hours, and then once they um, you know, they've, they've answered all the questions and collected all the information that they needed to collect and then have attended the minimum requirements for, um, for the educational piece, then um, we invest the resources and the time um, in creating an orchard for them. So, um, you know, I, I think that that really works well for us. Okay, great. Um, how do you accommodate IPM and pesticide programs in public orchards? Um, we teach um, uh, organic methods. Um, so um, this year we're, we're just starting to get into um, multiple classes, um, mainly taught through uh, the Extension Services in, in Michigan, through Michigan State University Extension. Um, and so we teach um, a number of things. First of all, if you're not spraying or not using any um, sort of um, organic pesticides um, or organic um, uh, pest prevention, um, then uh, we, we really teach people about how to um, 
raise the fruit that is available from the trees. Um, uh, there's a lot of, there's very, very few, um, number one grade uh, fruit is very hard to come by if it's not sprayed. Um, but there are a lot of number twos that are available and, um, you know, and, and we also have a couple of cider presses that allow us to take, you know, the, the fruit that is even um, beyond that. Um, you know, so we, we really try to teach people about what to expect um, with an orchard that's not sprayed um, and, and what they can do with the product um, that, uh, that they actually get when it's not sprayed. Um, and then um, there are, are a few people who, um, who have begun to train at local organic um, uh, orchards with some of the guys there that, um, that, are, use, that are spraying but using um, organic methods. Um, but as you probably will hear from our next speaker, it's, it's um, pretty intense. It's a, it's a, a very rigorous schedule. All right. Are there any liability issues with getting into trees and picking the fruit, and how do you get around it? Um, yeah, that's a great question, um, and I think it, it goes back to um, who owns the property and, um, and what kind of coverage the property owner has. So. Um, uh, you know, we, we try to make sure that the property owner has signed off on, on all of the projects and that they understand um, the liability burden um, that the project entails. Um, usually our partners are community-based organizations that already have some sort of liability in coverage that, um, uh, that, that encompasses, um, you know, the, the work that we're doing in the garden or in the orchard. Um, so, that, you know, usually it's, it's not an issue. Um, we do have a number of... Um, actually probably thousands of beautiful fruit trees on public property, um, mature fruit, fruit trees that we didn't plant on public property throughout the city, and we have a number of people who are, have been gleaning um, that fruit, and, you know, technically it's um, city-owned or public property, and um, there's really um, a lot of gray area where that's concerned, with li the liability issues around that where that's concerned. And what year did you start again? Um, we started our um, urban agriculture programs in 2003, um, but we've been doing orcharding um, and creating orchards at the organization um, for nine or ten years now. So we do have a number of, of orchards that are mature um, and producing some really beautiful fruit. And did the organization feel that it was a departure from its current mission, and if so, how did they overcome that? You know, um, I whoever's asking that question, if if you kind of are in a, a very, um, uh, very solidly um, focused uh, forestry organization, we should talk because we did run into a lot of that. Um, for some reason, it's a it's it's a huge mental jump for some people from planting trees to getting into fruit trees even or or community gardens. And so our organization really tackled that head on. For the first couple of years, it kind of flew under the radar, but because it was identified um, as such a need by the community and because it did um, very early on experience a lot of success, we had to deal with it at the, the board of directors or in our case, the commissioner level. And so our organization went through an entire, um, you know, very um, in-depth uh, strategic revision, so a strategic uh, revision of our strategic master plan and really green-lighted and blue-skied all of the urban ag stuff that we were doing to make sure that it was very clear that it was something that our organization um, supported and, and furthermore, um, you know, supported in, in doing the fundraising and staff support that was needed in order to keep it, um, you know, a thriving part of the greening of Detroit. And I think you might have started to answer this, but what have been your interactions with local government? Do you have to get any permits? You know, um, uh, we're talking about Detroit, so um, I think our our, our city is a little different um, than most in that um, uh, it, it, it's uh, um, sometimes ask for forgiveness before ask permission um, uh, uh, in our city. That's typically how things are done. Um, uh, on the books, um, technically you're not allowed to plant, you know, fruit trees and the right-of-ways and um, between the sidewalk and street. Um, however, you know, we've had some requests from different city departments to do that, um, and when it's clearly in opposition for, you know, in the rules that, that, the, that they created. So um, we, we do have some, some issues with, um, on a number of levels, with agriculture in the city being, um, uh, uh, being supported even, even by public officials, but, but, but not supported by the written, um, you know, zoning ordinances and code that was created, you know, 50 years ago or more. Um, so um, long story short, um, we, 
uh, we have a very good um, dialogue with the with the powers that be. Um, so if it's in a, in the parks, we have a very great relationship with recreation, and we're always letting them know what we're doing and asking for permission. Um, and um, we, uh, you know, likewise, if we're working, uh, you know, in a, uh, along a city right away, uh, along a road, we're working with our general services division and making sure that we're communicating very clearly. How do you select the species cultivars to plant? You know, um, I kind of, I, I, I hope you guys know this. I made a plug for Fedco trees um, uh, in one of my slides. Um, Fedco trees out of Vermont is, um, a terrific, um, a terrific resource that has a lot of um, a lot of heirloom variety fruit, um, and it's got a lot of description um, for the different fruits that are available. Um, so uh, we, we, you know, it's a it's a combination of going with things that we know do really well in this area and incorporating things we want to try out in this er in this area, particularly heirloom varieties, and bring those back. Okay. Uh, Sarah from the Delaware Center for Horticulture says, I see that the fruit trees are planted directly into the soil. Do you test it prior to planting and remediate it in any ways? Um, yeah, actually we do. Um, all of our 850 garden sites, um, we test for heavy metals, um, pH, and organic nutrient content. So um, so we, we definitely pull a test on, on, all, um, on all sites, and if it exceeds the direct contact limits, um, we, we choose another site, frankly. Um, we have, uh, our city's about one-third vacant, um, so we have this beautiful luxury of, of having a lot of choice with land and having a lot of options with land. Are the harvests of the community orchard program sold to support the greening of Detroit? Are volunteers and community members allowed to partake in the harvest? Yeah, actually, I could probably talk for hours about our, our Grown in Detroit cooperative, um, and, and I'm happy to answer in depth any more questions about that. Um, but we have um, about 85 um, of our urban gardeners who um, participate in our, our farmers cooperative that sells to six different weekly farmers um, markets and about a dozen stores. Um, some, some of those farmers um, specialize in fruit. Um, or contribute to fruit, um, most of them do not. Um, in order to um, participate in our cooperative, you have to be a, um, a Grown in Detroit Garden Resource Program member, and um, you have to have a clean soil sample on file. You have to um, uh, uh, verify that you're not using any pesticides or herbicides. Um, and uh, then you, we have this very in-depth process of, of, of selling and how, um, how the standards are met for, for the sales. And in the end, 100% of the profits go back to the grower. Um, Greening of Detroit is one of those you know, 80 or more growers. And um, the profits from our, um, our sales um, uh, help to subsidize some of the other sales for other growers. So um, yeah, we are definitely making money from um, from fruit and vegetable sales. However, all of that is going back to the gardeners. How is the Orchard Project funded, and who does the education presentation? Okay, so let me start with um, the education. Um, so uh, we have a really terrific system of education where we utilize um, uh, uh, national and regional experts, we utilize um, statewide experts, and we utilize um, local experts. So um, a lot of the advanced classes and in, in, um, in workshops are taught by, uh, like I said, Michigan State University Extension or um, you know, other um, very well-respected experts, quote, unquote. Um, however, uh, um, uh, after a number of years of our community gardeners um, kind of seeking out a specialization and getting really good at what they do, um, we ask that they give back to the community by um, teaching and facilitating um, workshops. So a lot of our basic classes are taught by our community gardeners and orchardists. Um, funding, though, uh, you did ask about funding. Um, so our the the nursery component of our orcharding and in fruit perennial fruit operation is really really important to driving down costs. So um, we um, we're typically buying that those bare root fruit tree whips for you know. 10 to $20, and um, three years later, they're, they're on the market worth $350 or $400. Um, so we significantly reduce our costs by, um, by being as self-sufficient as possible. Um, and um, 
the the co the costs that we do incur um, are usually supported by um, uh, registration and membership fees or um, grants um, to to local organizations uh, from local organizations. Okay, you mentioned that food is sold at farmers markets into local restaurants. Does this become a source of funding for the program? Um, again, a hundred percent of the profits. Um, I we're making. Um, Oh geez, about two thousand to two thousand five hundred dollars a week in um, fruit and vegetable sales um, these days, and again, a hundred percent of that goes back to the growers. Um, and um, and in in the case where the greening of Detroit um, product is getting to market, a hundred percent of of um, well, not a hundred percent, a lot of the profit goes back to subsidizing the the farmers, and I can tell you how that's done. Um, you know, another time if you're really interested in it. Um, the the additional um, profits that aren't subsidizing those growers are going back to support our programs. So, for example, if we need to pay um, the mileage cost for our MSU extension teacher, or if we're bringing someone in and you know they request a stipend of fifty dollars, or we we've offered a stipend of fifty dollars, that the money from the profits of the fruit and vegetable sales will go to pay for the the um, for that cost. Okay. How do you deal with that traditional forestry programs often consider fruit trees to be messy and a nuisance? How do you ensure that the fruit is properly harvested? Um, you know, we um, we teach about 60 different classes a year in our urban agriculture department. Um, and harvesting, um, you know, May, June, July is really, really um, a focus of, of education of that time. Um, you'd be surprised about how something that you kind of take for granted and, and you think is so simple um, is really um, very complicated to people who are new to this. Um, and so we, again, we, we, teach, um, we teach all kinds of harvesting and post-harvest um, handling and care, as well as um, grading, particularly for, for um, the, fruit, the fruit tree um, uh, fruit. Okay, what are the most popular fruits and which take the least amount of care? You know, plums. Um, the the photo that I that I I had in the the slideshow of those plums in um, that were, that were brought to market. Um, you know, apples. It's really hard to do organically. And again, I'm not a, a fruit expert. We have one coming on after me, so I'm I might be telling. Um, <laughs> it just might be my own experience. But you know, apples are are you know they're 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 very challenging to get perfect apples. But plums. Um, at least in Detroit, in our climate and um, microclimate, um, are really um, they they mostly come out number ones, and they they make a ton of money at at market. We also have a lot of um, a lot of luck with peaches and apricots coming coming out fairly perfect. Um, uh, uh, pears and apples are are a little bit harder for us. Have you done market research on what produce and fruits local restaurants will buy, and if so, how did you do it? Yes. So um, again, we have about 850 gardens that we work with. That that breaks down to about 11,000 gardeners, one in out of 100 in our city or thereabouts. Um, and we have a very high return rate in our programming. So our return rate in programming is about 80%. So that means that gardeners get in the program and very few leave, uh, which is and and they collect you know the leadership opportunities and the um, and the educational offerings, like their, um, you know, their uh, their baseball cards or something. So we we basically we cultivate these these community gardeners and orchardists that have a lot to offer, um, and want to take on leadership roles either in teaching or in this case, um, we have a, a farmers market work group, and the work group is made up of um, the leading sellers, and the leading sellers basically decide where we sell, what the price is, how it's packaged, how it's washed, stored, et cetera. Um, and so that work group makes all of the decisions for how things are, are sold and, 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 um, and offered to our clientele. We um, at the Greening of Detroit support a full-time person who is our you know, fruit and vegetable expediter, so to speak. Um, it, it's the, the, um, the person that coordinates all of our farmer's market efforts, as well as our retail and wholesale sales. And so she makes, um, you know, the, the work group signs off on we want to sell to them, and they've decided, um, at least for the time being, we don't sell outside of the city of Detroit. So she takes meetings with local, um, particularly um, 
uh, restaurants, and she gets um, an, uh, uh, basically what their demand is. And um, some things we sell them to restaurants, and sometimes some things we refuse to sell to restaurants because we can just get too much money for it at the farmer's market. So she she basically cultivates a relationship with every restaurant that wants to buy from us and um, and basically um, gets the products from gardeners and, um, uh, and then um, sends the product with an invoice for payment um, to the, the uh, restaurants about once a week. Okay. Does the operator have any questions in queue? Uh, yes, we do have a couple of questions. Our first question comes from Chris Sposa. Your line is now open. Chris, are you on the line? Okay, uh, Chris, if, uh, if your phone's having trouble, you can type your question in or you can uh, try to ask your question again. Uh, the next question, please. That comes from Ron Lo Lovejoy. Your line is open. <laughs> Hello, this is Vaughn. I work with uh, Tree Utah, uh, a nonprofit that got started also in urban forestry programs. I'm wondering where you got your funding to make the switch over to this program because we've been working with it in a slightly different way with permaculture and we have a demonstration garden in that, but we're really struggling to find a way to fund this now and, and I really like how you presented it in terms of community orchards. So. What suggestions would you have for another nonprofit wanting to move in this direction of how to get it funded to start with? Thank you. Um, thank you for the question. Um, well, what I can tell you from experience is that um, that typically orchards are a terrific um, a terrific project to pitch to the the smaller scale funders in your community. For example, if you have an orchard that has um, let's just say um, 20 trees in it, um, and those trees cost um, about $20 a piece. You're looking at a, you know a, a project that's um, very very doable um, uh, for a local church group, for example, who has um, you know during during the fall usually there's there's um, there's harvest or or f emergency food fundraisers. So you have a very um, you know with the trees, the tree guards. The, maybe the soil amendment, maybe a co the cover crop. You have um, you have a, a pretty package of expenses to present to um, a, a smaller scale funder um, that that would really like maybe to be involved in the planning or the um, the, the planting day um, as volunteers and and you know um, typically give in that um, in that range. Um, so I hope that's helpful. Um, and, and then. Um, uh, it, one of the great things um, for an organization like yours that um, typically um, has a, a history of, um, of being known as a forestry organization, uh, there are a ton of, um, of you know, local and national um, funders that specialize in, um, in, in all of the different facets that community gardening and community food um, can, can reach. Some, some of those facets include um, uh, crime, crime reduction, Public health. Um, uh, you could you could make um, you know you could make a, a, a large argument for for um, cha challenging um, some of the causes for preventable diseases such as diabetes and, and um, uh, you know um, I'm, I'm losing it. But um, but uh, there's a, a very wide variety of um, of causes that are very fundable. That a typical environmental or a, a forestry organization um, can't tap into, but now can if they add um, the the fruit tree or the community garden um, portion to their their offering. Okay, great. Thanks, Ashley. And I'm going to hold the questions at that. Um, if there are other questions in queue, we can take them at the end of the session. I let it run a little bit late just because we started a few minutes behind the schedule, but I do want to get to Dave because we have another great presenter. So thank you, Ashley. You're very welcome. Um, our second presenter today uh, is Dave Jackie. Um, I apologize if I said that wrong, Dave. I just realized that I didn't uh, yeah. pronounce it. <laughs> um, Dave is the primary author of the award-winning two-volume book, Edible Forest Gardens, and has studied ecology and design since the 1970s, and has run his own design firm, Dynamic Ecological Design, since 1984. An engaging and passionate teacher of ecological design and permaculture, he has designed, built, and planted landscapes, homes, farms, 
and communities in many parts of the United States as well as overseas. Dave co-founded uh, the Land Trust at uh, Gap Mountain in Jaffrey, New Hampshire, and he homesteaded there for a number of years. He holds a BA in Environmental Studies from Simons Rock College and an MA in Landscape Design from the Conway School of Landscape Design. And I'm particularly happy to, uh, to welcome Dave because he is uh, our uh, pinch hitting for the session. Our other presenter had a family emergency come up and we're fortunate to have such a fantastic speaker um, come in and uh, on short notice for us today. So thank you, Dave. Thank you, Jared. Um, the slide that's showing is actually the last slide. Can, can we, like, all of a sudden switch all the way to the beginning of the slideshow? Sorry about that. Some way to do that? It's backing up. Okay. Be a minute. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is, is uh, I, I kind of want to take the, the topic of the day is community orchards, and I want to flip that around and talk about orchard communities because um, we very often, when we are looking at uh, planting trees, um, we forget to think to realize that the reality that trees are parts of ecosystems. Um, and I think Ashley did a great job of talking about uh, orchards as part of human communities, but I'm going to talk a little bit more about the ecosystem aspect. And this is obviously a, a very huge topic. In fact, the, the books that I wrote, I was intended to write a book. I ended up writing a two-volume monster book uh, on this topic. So it's not something I can do uh, a whole lot of justice uh, on in, in, in just a few minutes, but I'll, I'll give it a shot. Um, but uh, basically what we're talking about is what, what I call, what we call a forest garden. And, and uh, don't let the word forest confuse you there because really what we're talking about is using the forest as a design metaphor that we're mimicking the structure and function and pattern and process of how forest ecosystems operate in order to design uh, a, an orchard or a garden that um, will have many of the same properties that an ecosystem has such as self-maintenance, self-renewal, uh, self-fertilization and so on. So we're consciously designing ecosystems but at its most basic level uh, forest garden is a perennial polyculture of multipurpose plants. So perennials are plants that have a three to three thousand year lifespan. A polyculture, in contrast to most agriculture, uh, a polyculture is when you have many different species growing in each patch of ground. Um, and much of the art and science behind this is about how do we design polycultures that, that work uh, very effectively. And we want those plants to have multiple purposes. So ideally, each species will have at least three uses or functions, including food, fuel, fiber, fodder, fertilizer, pharmaceuticals, and, of course, fun. Uh, that image there is a forest garden at 7,000 feet in the Rocky Mountains on the dry side of the Rockies. Uh, you can do this in many different environments, uh, even, even in some environments where forests don't grow naturally, uh, with, if you have some irrigation, for example. Um, but Basically, what we're talking about is trying to mimic whatever the natural ecosystem is of your bioregion. So in many parts of the world, in many parts of the U.S., that means that we're talking about forests. Um, and uh, this is a photograph of the first known temperate climate forest garden in modern times um, in the world. It's Robert Hart's forest garden in Shropshire, England, um, and it looks very foresty. Uh, as you can see, but uh, it's only 40 feet by 80 feet in size. It's surrounded on three sides by fields. Uh, and the fact that you can get a forest mimic to, to look like a forest in such a small area gives us, gives us hope, and there's actually some good evidence in the scientific literature that we can get many of the dynamics of forest ecosystems, uh, as I mentioned before, self-renewal, self-maintenance, uh, in small areas. Uh, the thing that I really want to emphasize here, though, is that not all forest gardens are forests. This is uh, in California at Copia Gardens. Almost everything you see in this little patch of ground is edible. Um, there's, there's bronze fennel and there's perennial kale and there's uh, a prune plum tree and all kinds of other stuff in there that's edible, but it can look like a suburban landscape. And, and so you can have your suburban landscape and eat it, too. And it doesn't have to look like a forest. It can look more like something from earlier in succession, a bunch of shrubs and trees mixed together with herbaceous ground coverage. It can look quite beautiful. It can look very, very typical uh, suburban as well. 
Uh, this is uh, a little more, a little less typical suburban. This is in uh, Greensboro, North Carolina. My friend Charlie Heddington and his partner Deb Seabrook's house. They have a very small lot. You can see they they like plants enough that their house, they're letting their house get swallowed there. Um, but you know they have different habitats in their environment there. The space between the sidewalk and the street is basically a prairie, uh, which is growing plants that are there to improve fertility, but also to attract beneficial insects. Uh, on the side there, on the bottom left, uh, is a four-foot-wide space between their house and their driveway. It's a very, very hot microclimate. In fact, that whole side of the house has been uninhabitable for m much of the time they live there. Until they started planting, you can see uh, to the right of that photograph, there's four columnar pears. These are pear trees that are have been bred to remain narrow and tall so that they can fit into a small space. Uh, Warren and Magnus are the two varieties they've got there, or columnar pears. There's, there's columnar apples, there's various other columnar uh, cultivars. Um, and those there are shading the windows of their dining room, and that made the dining room more inhabitable during the summertime. They have a trellis that goes up to the top of the second story windows of the house. They've got, um, uh, in, in their environment, they can't grow regular grapes. They can grow muscadine grapes, which are more heat tolerant. And the, once those grapes leaf out, the house gets cooled, um, and they've got food production going on even in that four-foot-wide space, um, as well as all the ground covers that are helping keep the ground uh, shaded. And you can see also two barrels are taking a runoff from the roof and using that to irrigate that space with a soaker hose with a little a little spigot on that on on the tanks there. The backyard on the right is just so crammed full of plants it's hard to tell that it's. Uh, you know, it's hard to take a good picture of it. Um, they do have annuals. You can see in the, in the little patch of sun, that's a zucchini plant, but they also have perennials. In the foreground is a pond. Again, the roof runoff uh, from the garage is seen in that pond, which provides habitat for beneficial uh, animals, such as frogs, uh, toads, and salamanders. And what they're doing is they're, they're creating a habitat. They're creating an ecosystem. So the different parts are working together to be greater than the sum of the parts. So by having all these different elements in there, the whole thing works together to reduce pests, improve soil, uh, and, and so on. But you can also do this on a rooftop. This is, uh, if you notice the website there, www.risc.org.uk, you can create ecosystems on the rooftops that have benefits for uh, reducing heating and cooling costs as well as beautifying the, the environment, um, reducing heat island effect on the, on, in urban areas. And also, the great thing, uh, at least if you're in the suburbs, if you have a rooftop garden, you don't have any problems with deer, because deer don't like to climb steps, so they don't jump up on the roof very much. So um, you can reduce problems with vandalism as well uh, in urban areas. That can be an issue. Um, uh, and so up on a rooftop, you're going to have less of a problem with that as well. So you just got to make sure you have a, an engineer, make sure you have strong enough roof timbers or whatever to hold the weight and you use special soil for that kind of situation. But that website there will give you many details on how to actually achieve that. Uh, that was in Reading, England. Um, but you can do this. There's a lot, of, a lot of rooftop gardening going on in the U.S. these days, too. But basically the idea here is that we're trying to mimic the structure and function of ecosystems. Uh, the four things that we're really trying to mimic there are the properties of the system, the principles behind the system that make them function the way they do, and the structure and the function, the patterns and process. And mimic creation that happens in natural ecosystems all the time, where, uh, for example, the, the monarch butterfly is a poisonous butterfly because it only eats uh, milkweed sap, which is uh, poisonous and makes it toxic to birds. And because it has that quality, it makes adaptive sense for it to have uh, a bright orange and black coloration so that it's visual predators can identify, oh, that's one of those, I don't want to eat that, it doesn't taste good. But when you have that kind of a species around, then other species will mimic that because it's to their advantage to look similar to the, to the monarch. And so the viceroy butterfly has evolved to look similar to the monarch because even though it's completely edible, when it looks like a monarch, it doesn't get eaten. And we're trying to do a similar thing. We're trying to get properties like these um, by designing gardens that mimic ecosystems. And these are properties that emerge from the dynamics, the interactions between the different parts of the system, not from the, the, the parts themselves. So, you, can, you know, having a stable ecosystem, a resilient ecosystem, a self-maintaining, self-regulating, self-renewing, self-fertilizing ecosystem, etc., 
is something that, that only the system can do. And, and, and we have to be looking at that system scale. And I think what, you know, what Ashley was talking about and what, what uh, organizations I've been involved with are talking about is trying to take these ideas and apply them to the social system for humans. And I think we can do that, and the gardens can be an educational tool and a model for teaching us how to do that in a human social structure. But basically, we're trying to create these ecosystems that have these beneficial qualities, and there's specific ways that we can achieve those things, uh, you know, uh, that, that we want to look at. And basically, it comes down to looking at these structure and function components. Um, in my book, this volume one of my book, I go into much more detail about this than I can today, but we're looking at the architecture, the physical architecture of the ecosystem. How many layers of vegetation are there? How many soil horizons are there? What's the density, padding, and diversity of the vegetation? Those are the things we actually design when we're designing an orchard or a garden. But we're trying to use those part elements of architecture to influence the interactions between species. How the, what kind of species niches uh, what, are the, what are the functions of the species that are there? What kind of community role do those play, the community niche? What kind of food web are we designing? Whenever we design an orchard or a garden, we're designing a food web whether we know it or not. If we do that more consciously, we'll do a better job at it. Um, and we also look at different uh, social structures called guilds and polycultures that are really what we're, tr we're trying to influence by designing the architecture. And then, of course, self-renewing fertility is, is, a, is a key thing and look, understanding Nutrient dynamics is a critical piece, as well as succession, which is in most parts of the country, if you have bare soil and you stop managing it, mowing it, weeding it, whatever, it'll turn back into forest. And that process of change is called succession. And if we mimic that process of ecosystem change over time, we can reduce our, our labor. Um, so, you know, I want to focus a bit on, on, on soil and soil fertility because particularly in urban areas is a, a big issue, but for all orchards it's a huge issue. And, and, and I want to give a few ideas about how this ecosystem approach will, will be different because most of the time people, uh, many times people just plant trees into the soil and don't do a lot of, a lot of testing as Ashley was talking about. We need to test the soil and understand the nutrient dynamics, we also need to understand the ecosystem of the soil and how it's put together and how it works so we can work with that rather than against it. And, you know, there's different horizons of the soil, um, and they each have different functions. The organic horizon is the litter layer. That's where the mulch goes, and that's kind of the recycling center uh, for the soil ecosystem. Uh, all that material ends up breaking down and assimilating into the A horizon, the assimilation horizon, being assimilated into the mineral soil. And assimilation is the dominant uh, function in that horizon of soil. It's where most roots live, where most organisms live. Uh, the E horizon, we don't always see the leaching layer. Uh, if it's there, it's usually white or light gray. And it's a place where there's not much nutrient or food for plants or other organisms because it's also getting washed down into lower layers of the soil uh, where it's being stored, like the B horizon. The banking horizon is that where all those leaching nutrients get deposited, and we have to we have to make sure the ecosystem can recycle those nutrients back up to the top to get the system to work. And if we're not paying attention to that dynamic in particular, we're not going to do a good job of getting self renewing fertility and minimizing our need for fertilizer. So um, the layers below that, the C and D horizons, are really what provide the constitutional bedrock for the soil. If you have a, a, a soil, subsoil, that is low in calcium, your topsoil is likely to be low in calcium also. If your subsoil is low and is high in potassium, it's likely to be high in potassium in the, in the, in the topsoil also. So we have to get some sense of what's going on there and what those dynamics are. So what really the, the, the key points from this are that we want to feed the soil from the top. Chemical fertilizers are kind of uh, bypass the system, and, it, it, and chemical fertilizers actually kill organisms in the soil. Even even standard doses of nitrogen fertilizer, urea, urea fertilizer, will actually kill large portions of the soil food web, and that actually inhibits the ability of the plants to be healthy because the plants and the soil ecosystem are actually one thing. You can't separate them. And so we really want to support the organisms in the soil by feeding the soil from the top, having decomposers as part of the system, and then having deep-rooted plants that will cycle nutrients from below and that we call those plants dynamic accumulators. They, they, they suck specific nutrients out of the soil and deposit them in the surface. 
We also need to understand the soil horizon because if you don't decompact the soil, if you, if you have a shallow soil that is shallow, shallow, shallow rooting zone of, for the plants, they will not be healthy. Uh, a study in Arkansas and, and, and Missouri showed that apples that could even get 10% of their roots in the deeper soil will produce more fruit and have and produce more consistently. They'll live longer and they have less pest disease and drought damage. So before you plant your tree in any orchard, you need to do some pit. Dig three feet down to the soil if you can. See what the layers are. Um, there's many resources that will help you, uh, you know, assess the different horizons and, and their texture, structure, consistency, and what, those, what the soil is like down there. And if you can do some site preparation ahead of time, whether that's uh, deep tillage, uh, you know, if you can go down two feet with a with a with a chisel plow or with double digging by hand, which is a lot of work, uh, but it's it's a good thing to do. It's a major investment, but you will have a long term impact on the health and productivity and reduce labor for your your garden. So we really got to start with the soil. Um, now we also have to think about the root areas. Uh, the soil affects how widespread the roots of the trees are. Studies have shown that fruit trees roots, even in the best soils, the, the myth in our culture is that the roots spread to the drip line of the crown of the trees and that's as far as they go. But even in the best soils, the roots will spread to one and a half times the diameter of the crown of the trees. That's the top of that image there. Uh, the bottom image shows what happens in poor soils. If you have shallow, dry, or infertile soils, the root diameter will be three times the crown diameter, which is a huge, huge difference. And you can see the difference there. We really have to plan our spacing of our trees based on what the soil conditions are. If you have a high water table or you have a compacted layer that you cannot get rid of by site preparation, you need to plant your trees more, uh, more with more space between them. Otherwise, they will be under stress and you will have to do more work uh, to, to take care of them and, and get a good yield out of them. So site preparation counts for a whole heck of a lot in making sure you have long-term productivity and minimum maintenance on your trees. Many pest and disease problems are made worse by stress on trees caused by soil conditions. We can also plant companion plants with our trees. Uh, nitrogen fixing plants, many people know about these. They, they make a, a deal, the nitrogen fixing plants make a deal with bacteria that live in the soil that uh, improve the soil by pulling nitrogen out of the air and improving the soil. And then we have dynamic accumulators, which also uh, as I said before, they'll pull specific nutrients. Comfrey is one of the best ones. It's, uh, you can see the list of nutrients that accumulate at the bottom there, uh, potassium, phosphorus, calcium, copper, uh, iron, and magnesium. It will accumulate out of the subsoil and improve the topsoil. The problem with crushing comfrey is that, or with comfrey is that it's very persistent. Once you plant it, you can't get rid of it very easily at all. But it's a great plant for many different uses, as you can see there. And then we have French sorrel, which is an edible, uh, also accumulates phosphorus, potassium, calcium, iron, and sodium. Uh, it's a great sour edible green, grows in part shade. You can plant it under your fruit trees to help build the soil under the fruit tree while you get a crop out of it. Uh, if you have lead in your soil, you don't want to be growing greens, however, because greens do accumulate lead in the leaves. So uh, fruits do not, not take lead into the fruit, um, but uh, greens are an issue there. We also want to make sure we have ground covers to help complete the ecosystem and keep the soil covered. Um, keep the soil healthy that way. Uh, these are a couple of my favorites. Uh, prostrate birds from tree foil is a, a nitrogen keeping ground cover. It's only one to two inches tall. Uh, it's very dense and trample tolerant. We'll take, we'll take, uh, some, some foot traffic. Uh, green and gold is a great beneficial insect attracting ground cover. So, um, we also want to include mushrooms. Uh, mushrooms are critical components of ecosystems. They break things down and uh, many of them are edible. Some will also accumulate, bioaccumulate lead and other, other toxics, so you have to be careful. Uh, Paul Stamets' book, uh, Mycelium Running, had a list of which ones will accumulate uh, heavy metals and so on. But this one, this one, Wine Capture Fairy, is a very tasty, uh, we call it a gourmet decomposer, and we highly recommend it. It's very easy to grow, and you can grow it in garden soil along with vegetables as well as under fruit trees. And all those things and more are components of ecosystems that we need to be in including to help build soil and help keep trees healthy as part of a whole, a whole system. So that's the key point. We want to plant ecosystems, not just plant trees. Um, 
And uh, of course, there's much more I could say, but I will take I have a couple a couple minutes for questions, and I, I guess I should take some of those. Perfect. Thanks, Dave. And uh, yeah, sorry for getting us started late there. Um, if the operator can open the lines for questions, please. Yes, sir. Once again, please press star one on your touchdown phone if you would like to ask a question. That is star one if you would like to ask a question. Great. And I, I, I heard one plug for your book, but uh, I want to emphasize, too, that I know a number of the, the groups that we're working with, that's uh, one of their major resources. So can you tell everyone how they can get your book? Um, yeah, uh, you can get it, uh, you know, at Amazon or you can order it from local bookstores. You can also get it directly from me, which I appreciate because I'm still paying off the debt from writing the thing. Uh, so edibleforestgardens.com, I still have a discount there. Uh, just go to the About the Book page and you can order directly there. Uh, the first volume is uh, all about the ecology of forest ecosystems and how that applies to the design and management of, of uh, forest garden ecosystems. And the second one, the second volume is the design and practice. How do you design an orchard? How do you design a forest garden? And has a, a list of uh, 625 different plant species and all the different functions and, and ecological tolerances and so on to help people out in terms of putting things together. Great. Thanks. Yep. Does the operator have any questions in queue? I'm showing no questions at this time. Okay. Well, um, in the interest of time, I'll, uh, I'll let our presenters go. I think it's a missed opportunity since uh, we've got Dave on the line now. But uh, you know, I, I really do appreciate Dave filling in uh, last minute like this. And I uh, thought it was a great pre presentation. I, I feel empowered to go uh, put, put a garden in my backyard even. Well, I could say one more thing, too, and, and uh, Ashley was talking about education uh, as part of her program that she does there, and I would really encourage folks to get people involved in designing the orchard as well, uh, that I find that when I teach design that it's a very empowering uh, experience and people uh, learn a lot from doing the designs they don't learn from doing the management. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, 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 I really think that the more... Being, doing design is, I believe, an inherent part of being a human being. We're, we're, we, we were created with the capacity to design. We do it all the time. We do it mostly unconsciously. But when we train people how to do design in a more conscious way, uh, it, it really changes people's lives and helps them to engage, learn how to engage and communicate and collaborate and listen and observe. Um, and it's a great community building exercise. So um, even if it's a simple orchard as opposed to a forest garden, getting people involved in making those choices can be a very empowering experience. I'd have to agree, and I just I also want to give a, a plug to, to Dave and, and his books. Um, they have been really, really important um, to our kind of development um, of, of our orcharding, as well as the permaculture um, projects and work groups that we have here. And um, as a visual learner, I will tell you that they are fantastic to kind of really visually represent some of the really complex ideas um, uh, that need to be conveyed in order to understand permaculture. All right. Well, thanks, y'all. So I put a, a, a URL up on the screen right now. This is, um, this is our survey, which helps us to improve our program. And everyone who completes the survey, there, there are only a couple questions, so it should just take a couple minutes. We will send you a link in about a week for where you can get this recorded session and download the presentation. Um, and they will be available in about a week. So the uh, the next webcast session is on October 15th. It's the value of shade, energy, and climate impacts. Um, but otherwise, I want to thank our presenters, Ashley and Dave, all the participants who joined in, and our sponsors for today's call, the Home Depot Foundation and the USDA Forest Service. Thanks, everyone. Thank, thank you, Jared.